Bonsoir mesdames et messieurs et bienvenue à la recherche en lumière de l'école de musique Shuli. C'est la dernière séance de notre septième saison. Uh, good evening ladies and gentlemen and welcome to Research Alive at the Shulik School of Music. Uh, this is the last session of our seventh season. Uh, with this series we aim to bring alive the humanistic, scientific and engineering research in music as well as research that goes on behind the scenes in music performance and composition which will be the subject of tonight's event. We're already preparing the eighth season uh, of Research Alive, so check back in the fall for some new and exciting presentations of research in music scholarship and practice. For the last Research Alive event of the season, we have a different format with a round table of composers and uh, performers, and uh, we've all participated in a special project that's called Composer Performer Orchestration Research Ensemble, or CORE, C-O-R-E for short, and if we take CORE and turn it around backwards, it's EROC, which means Ensemble de Recherche sur l'Orchestration Contemporaine. Uh, I'll introduce our guests and give a brief overview of the CORE project within the broader actor partnership. Then we'll get some reflections on the project itself from the performers and composers, and highlight a few excerpts of some of the pieces that we played at tonight's concert. And we'll try to get into the orchestrational thinking that went into them. So we'll start off, I'll introduce our composers. So we have uh, Alex Blank, who was in the first round of CORE a couple of years ago. And that one never got to have its concert because of it, which shall not be named. Uh, <laughs> Jian Li, who is uh, in this year's CORE. Uh, Quentin Lovray, who was in the original uh, CORE as well. And then we have Darren Shu, who's actually from uh, U University of British Columbia over there. And Louis-Michel Tougat from McGill, uh, this, uh, both in this year's CORE. And I'll mention why we have UBC people here in a minute. And the empty chair is uh, Mariah Many, who will be here in a moment, hopefully. Uh, the actor partnership, uh, now let's move on to the, the performers. So first of all, we have our conductors, who are Frédéric Alexandre Michaud, right there, and Guillaume Bourgogne, who also co-taught this seminar uh, with me here at McGill. And then we have on violin, Nabeli Wontuk, and uh, Alex Hachibat <laughs> <laughs> on flute. <laughs> Don Lai Shi on piano, <coughs> uh, Micah Cooker on uh, trombone, uh, Rizzi Wong on uh, vibraphone and percussion, Alex Ortens on bass clarinet, and Amelia Smertz on uh, cello. And so this was a, an ensemble that's been working together for the whole year, basically. Uh, the Actor International Partnership aims to <coughs> stimulate new approaches to the analysis, teaching, and creation of orchestration. Uh, orchestration in our sense is taken in a very broad sense uh, of the selection, combination, and juxtaposition of sounds to achieve a desired uh, sonic goal in music. So it applies to all kinds of music, not just orchestral or chamber concert music. Within the actor uh, partnership, five core groups were formed in Canadian and U.S. universities, one at McGill, one at UBC, uh, one at the University of California at San Diego, the University of Montreal, and the University of Toronto. And there's a new one joining in Switzerland at the Haute École de Musique de Genève this year. The aim is to promote and document active and collaborative orchestration problem solving between performers and composers, and to give these musicians an extended opportunity to explore orchestration together. In the first round in 2018 to 2020, 22 short pieces or etudes for a quartet of violin, bass clarinet, trombone, and vibraphone, plus small percussion were composed. Uh, this unconventional instrumentation was selected for posing unusual challenges in achieving blended sounds and smooth transitions between instruments, thus bringing collective orchestration decision-making between performers and composers to the fore. Uh, using the same instrumentation at all institutions and identical recording protocols developed by Martha De Francisco of McGill in collaboration with the UCSD colleagues allowed for a direct comparison of evidence from each institution's activities. And this formed a basis for more, more elaborate analysis and experimentation. Concerts and readings were held at UBC and University of Toronto, and recordings were made at UBC, UCSD, McGill, and the University of Montreal. Although the pandemic halted the final concerts and exchanges of pieces across the four universities, the project nonetheless was already given rise to a plethora of material for analysis, some of which was presented uh, last year at the Nova Contemporary Music Meeting in Lisbon. At tonight's concert, however, we will finally be able to hear the McGill pieces by Pedro Amdiba, Alexander Blanc, and Quentin Lovray, with a newly formed ensemble conducted by Charles-Éric Fontaine. And this will include one of the original core performers, Martin Daigle. 
And we'll also hear the three McGill pieces and two UBC pieces from this year's cohort for a septet that includes the original quartet plus flute, cello, and piano. The aim this round was to expand the orchestrational possibilities, and you'll hear the variety of approaches to both ensembles in tonight's concert. One primary aim of the current project is to analyze these materials from several perspectives to better understand the conception, realization, and perception of orchestration in young musicians in a research creation setting. Throughout the core project, the, entire, the creative process of exploration, orchestrational problem solving, and the realization of new music have been recorded, documented, and archived for consideration. Sketches and scores, recordings of workshop uh, sessions, rehearsals with transcriptions of performer, conductor, composer dialogues, and concert or studio recordings are being examined alongside transcriptions of video interviews with performers and composers and texts written by them. We have three analytical aims in mind. One is to combine score and oral analysis of the recordings according to various taxonomies of perceptual effects, orchestration techniques, and planal analysis and to examine the evolution of orchestration, orchestrational thinking in young composers through sketch studies, interview analyses, and the terminologies for orchestration techniques, various perceptual processes, and timbre perception that arise in discussing orchestration. And finally, to analyze verbal interactions between performers, composers, and conductors in a problem-solving situation. So that's basically the idea of this whole thing, was to really get composers and performers really interacting with each other. I don't know, if Guillaume, if you had anything that's why you like covered everything at, that <laughs> at that point. Okay. So, uh, but let's get some impressions from the participants. Um, so we're going to go around starting with the, uh, the performers. And I would like to ask each of them to say what were some of the highlights of this collaborative experience uh, for you from your perspective as a performer or a composer. We'll go to the composers next. And uh, we'll start with the performers. So Bailey, what, uh, say a few words to us about what this was for you. Yeah, I think my, my biggest takeaway from, from this project, as simple as it may seem, is starting from the sound and working backwards. So starting from an, an abstract idea and, and learning how to put it on the page um, with varying levels of abstraction depending on which composer we were working with. Um, but that's, that's something I think that can apply for me as a performer to all music I play, not even just contemporary music. So often, I mean, we're interpreters, so we, we see what's on the page, and then we need to interpret it and make it come alive, but to do the interpretation in our, in our ear, so to speak, first, and then, and then start from that point, I think was a, was a big challenge and discovery for me. Good, thanks. Alex? Alex? Nope. H. <laughs> we have two Alexes, so we have to... Um. Uh, for me, probably uh, two really big things from the whole <coughs> from the whole project and experience. Um, I've spoken a lot about it in the interviews that we did um, and in the presentations that we did as well last semester. Um, but for me, it was huge uh, to realize my um, role in the ensemble as a flute player, particularly because in an orchestra, in an orchestral situation, flutes are considered more soloistic instruments um, and in these pieces of course there's lots of solo moments as well but in the context of contemporary music where the aim is to create um, new timbral uh, sonic uh, goals and all this kind of stuff um, it really kind of brought to my attention um, that I'm just a little cog in, <laughs> in the big wheel of this ensemble and I just need to play my Part right, whether it's just a little harmonic, it really has an effect on the whole um, sonic result of the ensemble. Um, so that for me was huge. And then also the uh, notation. And um, knowing that I, as a performer, have a huge role in helping composers find solutions to um, what they're wanting to hear and how to put that on paper so that not only I'll be able to interpret it, but the next performer as well will be able to understand what they're looking to create sonically. Excellent point. Don't lie. Yes, so um, for this ensemble, the, this semester, I really pre Oh, sorry. For this ensemble, uh, this uh, whole year of ensemble working with everyone, I just 
uh, really appreciate everyone to bring out their ideas and how showcase their instruments. And we uh, we did and we did find something which is uh, out of the common sound of each instrument and bring out and put them together like just in terms of the sound itself, not just instruments, but just imagining the sound is sound themselves and then uh, find some solutions to work around the instruments. I think that was a, uh, a great, great process of putting everything together, including imagination, and then we uh, sort of work out uh, during the sessions. Uh, for me, personally, as a pianist, uh, this is, of course, a uh, uh, more contemporary music experience for me, and me also, uh, as a composer, me also, and I really appreciate how this working process, and I learned a lot of from other instruments and their special sounds and everything they can create. Yeah, that's, that's okay. Thank you. Uh, Michael. Yeah. Uh, on the flip side of Alex's coin, uh, in the orchestra, this isn't a solo instrument. <laughs> and uh, when you're one of seven, there's a certain more of a responsibility and more uh, you take on a different role. That's been very interesting for me to uh, assume these new contemporary roles uh, as a trombonist and with a formation as unusual as uh, this as far as instrumentation. Um, I thought it was great to start with uh, the, our per the performers. We, we got to present the instrument and then show what it can do. And the composers would then, uh, some things, peaked their ears, and they decided to keep it, and then they would take their own conceptions of uh, what they wanted to do, and they would have their own ideas, and then we could uh, suggest throughout the process uh, different ideas as well, um, which overall led to more, like a larger listening, I think, throughout rehearsals, uh, when you're not just trying to play your part, but knowing that the end goal is malleable, and what you are hearing can change that end product it was, it was very neat. Right. Easy. Je peux parler français? Anglais? Oui. <laughs> <laughs> uh, moi je trouve yes, ce très fort. Je trouve que ce projet est très très intéressant et c'est très différent que ce que je fais habituellement. Comme en tant qu'interprète, souvent on a une pièce on, on pratique, euh, on joue, mais euh, ce processus c'est hyper excitant, c'est que on a tous des témoins, témoins, on a des témoins de, de, de naissance des bébés musicales avec les compositeurs et avec les musiciens et euh, pendant euh, toute l'année on a discuté et euh, chaque petite couleur et petit euh, euh, big ou petit, huge ou, ou petit image de chaque section et chaque pièce et pour moi, la difficulté, la difficulté ou la spécialité de euh, chaque pièce, c'est comme, comment je peux correspondre dans les chorégraphies, de changer les paquets et créer des couleurs avec euh, euh, le keyboard en, en, en instrument et, euh, et essayer de comprendre c'est qu -ce, quoi la philosophie et, et l'histoire derrière de, de, de chaque pièce, derrière la partition et dans la vie de chaque compositeur. Et je trouve, euh, comme moi, ma, ma, mon principe, c'est l'humain est toujours avant la musique. Et on comprend maintenant euh, chaque compositeur, qu'est-ce qu'il veut vraiment. Et on a créé ça tous ensemble. Et euh, c'est très beau. <rire> Merci tout le monde. Alex um, Yeah. Uh, I would start by saying I, I, I enjoyed the very beginning of the class. Uh, in that we started talking about timbre terms in, in concrete terms with real words that describe specific effects. And so just having that beginning of thinking of timbre in a different way was already quite op uh, eye-opening for me. As a performer, I was kind of surprised how well this, this group turned out. <laughs> uh, not, not because we're not good musicians or anything, but because it's, it's, a, strange, it's a strange group. And when we did our interviews at the end of the first semester, when we said, "How? What? What sort of challenges can you imagine?" We were thinking, "Ah, oh, 
trombone's going to be too loud and the flutes, we're not going to hear the flutes and, and how are we going to match with the percussion and it just all worked partly because um, the composers knew what they were doing. <laughs> it just, you know, they were able to find these, these connections, for example, a, a, a bowed vibraphone matching with a harmonic of a violin, all these things, some extended techniques, some regular techniques of how you can make these instruments work together or work separately so that everything can be heard. So that I found especially interesting. I, I, I think um, I became sort of a more nuanced player in, in terms of what I was asked to do and the extended techniques that I had to learn, so that was uh, very rewarding. Yeah, that's um, I think one of the biggest things for myself as a performer was I noticed how much I tend to take for granted uh, what the standard of sound quality should be. And a, a lot of my personal practice time is spent standardizing this, you know, what kind of vibrato, what kind of tone. Um, and then this class was like a really hard hour and a half of like everything is different than I'm used to doing. And like it was, it was very engaging and really valuable to, to just kind of always be subverting and disturbing my expectations for what kind of sound I should be creating and what the ideal was. <coughs> Good, thanks. Fred. What do you think you Et donc, pour moi, je pense que la première chose qui m'est venue à l'idée quand on pose la question, c'est euh, toute l'amitié qu'on a créée comme groupe. Euh, un peu comme a dit Alex, euh, C'est vraiment particulier de, de trouver un groupe comme ça et d'essayer de tout faire fonctionner. Et, et particulièrement aussi par rapport aux, aux compositeurs qui nous ont laissé un, une, une page particulière de leur vie, de, de voir leur processus de création euh, et de, leur, de nous partager leur processus de création. C'est quelque chose de vraiment euh, très, 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 très euh, intime pour eux. Et donc, euh, toute l'amitié qu'on a pu créer dans ce groupe-là à travers les, les, les interprètes et les compositeurs. Puis ensuite, pour moi, euh, euh, un peu plus concret, euh, c'est toutes les, les, euh, les, 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 les choses que j'ai appris par rapport aux instruments qui sont joués ici. Euh, on, on a dû euh, trouver des manières de contourner des limitations, euh, des manières de, de, de trouver des, 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 des sons un peu différents. Et donc, euh, je vais avoir une plus grande expérience pour tout le, le reste de ma vie, euh, pour toutes les fois que je vais encore euh, diriger des pièces contemporaines pour aider les musiciens avec qui je vais, je vais travailler pour être certain qu'on qu on approche le plus qu'on peut à chaque fois de qu ce que le compositeur voulait écrire à la base, tout simplement. Et donc, euh, j'ai beaucoup appris par rapport à chacun des instruments qui sont ici, entre autres grâce euh, au partage de chacun des musiciens. Yeah, we had a very special group. It was a very wonderful group. Thank you. Merci, Faye. Faye. May I add something? And to try to summarize a little bit uh, what has been said. Uh, so this project, this uh, research ensemble, is um, focused and all about uh, orchestration, timbre, and creation. But we try, we are trying to um, collaborate in a more horizontal um, way uh, than the, the, the modernist tradition um, is used to. The modernist, the modernist tradition is m much more vertical. Uh, composer at the top of the hierarchy, uh, kind of if we if we use the analogy with the religion, that could be the the god, right? Uh, composers are a figure of the god, conductors are a figure of the pope, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, performers are a figure of the <coughs> clergy, the clergy, and, and then the audience, uh, the, the believers. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that's uh, an analogy that is, uh, I think, uh, that makes sense. And then today, um, I think uh, things evolve a lot, and, 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 and we tend to um, try to, um, we tend to, to be more horizontal and m less uh, vertical. And so, um, yeah, the gods are present, <laughs> and so there are not any more gods, because uh, if you see the god, it, it's not a god anymore. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, it's more very creative and uh, more interactive than uh, we are used to be, we are, we are used to do uh, usual in, 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 more, um, in, in more common projects and more usual projects. 
And so uh, we all learn a lot from, from uh, this uh, more horizontal uh, dimension of working together. So actually we're polytheists because we have six gods sitting at the table. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's move on now to the, uh, to the composers. And maybe you could tell us a bit about what this whole experience has been for you, like doing the collaboration. And we'll start down at the other end <coughs> with Mariah Many, who has yeah. now uh, shown up here uh, from yeah. the University of British Columbia. Can I do this? Um, I, I've been involved with different projects where like sometimes it's right if something, send it off and then they just perform it. Um, all through the spectrum of where something like this where it's really collaborative and um, I think what I really like about this is that it honors the process of creation. Like I think a lot of the times the public and ourselves, we kind of, the public thinks that an artist just springs forth and is able to like do stuff you know, just instantaneously, and aren't they so talented? And a lot of people don't see the work that goes on in the background and the process to, to getting there from learning the instrument or to working on a piece. I um, mean, even our, us ourselves, like, it's like, oh, this performance, this performance, and then the performance is good or it's bad, and you don't, um, and it's all f focused on the performance, but this, this process was really focused on the process. And I think, for me, that's really important um, that just knowing that process as it goes into it and really honoring it um, in the form of documenting it was really, really helpful. Um, it's also really cool to work with different groups. That's been the other thing. Because again, usually it's one performance, but this is like we've gotten to see a couple things, um, which I think is really cool. So, yeah. Darren. Yeah, I uh, agree with Mariah. It's a really enjoyable process uh, to work uh, alongside uh, musicians because um, it's great learning experience, especially with two different ensembles, mm -hmm. uh, then you know if something doesn't work with both, it's really you that screwed up. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so, um, but um, throughout the process, you, just, uh, you learn a lot and you have a lot more time to um, communicate with the musicians so that uh, they know more about what you're trying to do. And even that process can help them um, deliver the results that you're trying to uh, achieve. So that is um, very valuable. Um, yeah. yeah. I should mention that uh, we're, we tried to have exchanges to some extent between the different ensembles. So we brought over two UBC people here. And uh, one of uh, our people, uh, Louis-Michel Tuga, actually got his piece performed by the, the UBC ensemble in their concert as well. Louis-Michel. Yeah, um, one of the, the great uh, lessons I guess I got from this whole project is um, I think one of the responsibilities of the, of the composer, of composer in general, is to uh, so figure out how what you write on paper is going to be perceived in some ways by the audience. And as orchestration is sort of a different field than either you know harmony or rhythm or counterpoint <coughs> or whatever, and it's it's much less theorized. Uh, this this job of sort of figuring out exactly how it's going to sound uh, is sometimes hard, especially if you use uh, if you try out your experiment with different techniques and combinations. So the one of the great values of this project is that you can basically change your mind every week on what you you expect or what you want and you you can really test if what you think is going to come out is actually working or not. So for example if I I got some ideas about oh I want this instrument and this instrument to to blend together and create a, a single gestalt and then in rehearsal it doesn't sound like that at all. So I in, it's a very, it's a privilege actually to have this opportunity to, to change that for the next week and not for your next piece in six months or in a year. So that's, that's been a great, a great time working with all of the performers, which I heartfully uh, thank as well for their commitment throughout this process. And as well, uh, it's been a great opportunity for me to uh, be able to hear the difference between the playing in, Mo in McGill here in Montreal and also uh, from the performers at UBC and also to compare the uh, practicality of the notation in that sense. Right. Thanks, Michel. Quentin? Yeah, for, for me it was a really unique experience because, uh, well, multiple things. I think I'm more used to collaborate one-on-one -on -one with musicians. I think there's something intimate about it and which is very fruitful, but you're alone. And you, it's a way to sculpt the piece you're going to compose for the performer, which I find very beautiful. It's very uh, human, but 
But when you're with a group like this, you're in the same time dealing with every single musician and the dynamic of the group itself, which I found very interesting and kind of uh, troubling in the beginning because I didn't know where to, where to enter in the dynamic of the group. So I brought graphic sketches, I brought audio, and then, then audio actually worked well. And that's where I, I went in. Uh, the other thing that was really, really amazing was actually being able to talk in the same time in the parallel process with the composers and the performers. And I think uh, with Alex and Pedram, we can all agree that it's being able to brainstorm as a group of composers was really something unique that we don't really have the opportunity to do. And being faced with the same problems and trying to come together with similar solutions, but th that are then suited to our own music was really a unique, uh, yeah, really special experience. Okay. Thank <coughs> um, uh, Yeah, I also agree to what mm -hmm. Quentin just said. Uh, and to rephrase that into a different word, I would say that it was a whole progress of communicating. Um, and I learned a lot about how I should communicate through um, like my scores and the notations especially because uh, there was a lot of um, troubleshooting when I was doing that and um, I really appreciated how um, collaborative all uh, performers were and that made me learn a lot of things and on top of that it also made me think that uh, how do I perceive the ensemble in my musical language? Um, I think I tended to think an ensemble as like a body of a person. So like for example, it's gonna be really easy for me to um, lift my arms and change that into like lifting one of my feet or something like that. But it's also, it can be pretty tricky when like everything um, needs to be in sync when that's like uh, you know, like different people's bodies. So, uh, yeah, it made me think a lot about that. So, yeah, I really did learn a lot. And Alex? Yeah, I think uh, on reflection from having written the piece two years ago and then uh, going through a rehearsal process last year and then the rehearsal process this year, it's been really interesting to come back and look at all of the notes, all of the documentation, uh, and remember how the discussions that I had with the other composers the, and the performers uh, all ultimately changed how things uh, went from week to week, uh, but that there was just such a breadth of uh, different ways to tackle the same problem of achieving blend, of, of a, achieving sort of a, a unified group from this non-cohesive uh, mix. Uh, and so I, I just, you know, uh, it, it's something going forward, I want to sort of find a way to uh, incorporate this into my process of talking with composers who are doing the same things uh, and just always with that model of reflection and documentation because uh, really, it changed everything. Mm -hmm. uh, I just want to mention that one thing I found, uh, particularly from the composers and sort of against the, the verticalization that uh, Guillaume was mentioning, the horizontal, that they were all very much listening to the performers and ingesting what they said and really taking it seriously. And so there was a very nice sense of respect that was happening between, between the whole group. Thanks, everybody. Let's move on to another topic now, and uh, we'd like to understand. So at McGill, what we did was we had a sort of series of introductory lectures on perception, composition, performance, and so on, and trying to get into some of the timbre terms <coughs> and the thinking about the perceptual results of orchestration. And then based on that, we then had people analyze a couple of pieces um, and to look at uh, what was going on in those pieces from these standpoints. And then we went into a kind of a, sort of an exploration phase where the composers would come with ideas and performers would come with ideas and people were trying out a lot of stuff. And then as sketches started to happen, we went into the next stage uh, where it's sort of problem solving with both notation and orchestration and all that. And then on to the final realization stage where we're actually rehearsing the pieces and making some final tweaks and so on and so forth. 
And at McGill, I think it's different from all the other institutions, it actually happened over two full semesters every week for an hour and a half. So there was a lot of contact that was happening with everybody. Um, but I wanted to get now an imp some input from Darren and Mariah about uh, exactly how the process worked uh, over at UBC so we can get a sense of the similarities and differences between institutions in, in this kind of a process. Do you want me to go first? Sure. Yeah. Um, we, our process was a little bit different. Um, we went, we were talking about it like in November, December, we were kind of getting a preliminary of what would be going on. I, I personally did a lot of research myself because I'm really interested in it, so I did a lot of personal research um, on timbre and kind of what it was, um, but we didn't really get going until January. And then because we got pushed back because of COVID, everything was online, so we didn't, we didn't do too much before the rehearsal. We did some Zoom meets with the musicians, kind of hearing the sounds. And that was really important because it's like not only, oh, what can a trombone do? But it's like, what can this trombonist do? Um, and really writing for the ensemble, which I, I consider a real gift. It, it feels like more of a teamwork thing. So I think there was a lot of that. Um, and then we met like almost every week at the end of January, beginning of February. Yeah. Um, and that would be like all three of the, the composers were there. We'd have them go through. I, I threw everything at them. I had <laughs> I had aleatoric scores, and then I'm like, nobody feels comfortable with the chance notation, so that's not a good idea. Um, I think we all did kind of experiment. So there was just a lot of experimenting, um, and then feedback from the musicians, like that's not playable, or <laughs> or that sounds cool. Um, yeah, and then it culminated in us. Uh, having a deadline and finishing it. So, yeah. Anything um, to add, Darren? Yeah, I think Mariah summed it, summed it up pretty well. I would just add that um, the taxonomy was um, taught through private lesson uh, through yeah. with Dr. Keith Hamill because he is also teaching uh, both of us. Um, mm -hmm. And so um, instead of having a seminar, um, it was like more of a one on one yeah. uh, lesson sort of thing with Dr. Keith Hamill. Lots of discussion. Yeah. yeah. Right. Okay, thanks. Uh, now what I'd like to do is ask um, uh, Alex and Quentin to tell us a little bit about, uh, about their pieces since we don't have, it's a different ensemble so we can't do any sort of excerpts from that, but you'll hear it tonight if you come to the concert, to tell us a little bit about what some of your orchestrational aims were in each of your pieces and how the collaborative process uh, sort of helped you, sort of enabled finding solutions to what you were trying to get to. Sure. Yeah, uh, for my my particular aim was to, again, achieve the most cohesive uh, blend from these four instruments, which uh, are so, so distinct and have such different uh, capabilities as far as loudness uh, and you know, timbre. Uh, so at the start, it, for me, uh, all formed from doing these sort of guided listening examples uh, or, or exercises uh, where I would give each performer a different directive that was at cross purposes, but ask them at the same time to blend. So not knowing what anybody else could do, uh, there was this sort of goal of blending and uh, at the same time all of their directions were uh, working against that. And the, the results were extremely interesting to me and uh, quite fruitful. Uh, and so over the course of the two months of actually writing, the, the score that we'll hear tonight, uh, it, it had this uh, underlying idea of just constantly pushing and changing uh, with every, every moment something new is happening, uh, but it's all to remove the idea of there being four people and rather just <coughs> one meta instrument that is the, the result of the blend of those four. Yeah. For for me, I think the the main goal was to make it work, <laughs> <laughs> to have a piece that is that doesn't sound well, I don't know, ridiculous or whatever would be the term, uh, and and make it convincing. And for me, that's yeah, that's of course very important. And that that was also finding a, a set of ideas that could fit the instrumentation, and not have just abstract ideas that sound good in my head and then I find a way to kind of s smash them against the instruments but find a way that 
the ideas are embodied already in the in the instrumentations and uh, that was i think a, a success and i think that's something i've really tried uh, uh, going for in the in the following pieces and then after this i was always really interested in this I don't know if you can call it like this fusion, which is not really a blend, in which you can really hear the different parts. But at the same time, we can feel that there is one sound. Mm -hmm. And I've I always been very fascinated, and I wasn't very conscious of it while working on the piece. That's definitely something I was going for. So a sound that is very united, in the same time that has enough richness or poly, poly or different faces, so we can really hear different sides of the sounds and all how all the instruments are working together in the sound. I like this idea of um, blend can be either a unicity or a multiplicity. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, this is very interesting uh, to look at because it's like there's a sort of a hierarchy of way that the way things group together. Sort of the most basic one is everything gets fused together into a single entity and you can't tell apart the individual sources. And the other one is where you can hear there's multiple sources, but you know they all go together. They've been grouped together in some way by whatever the compositional <laughs> process that's going on is. That's I find that very interesting. Alrighty, so now let's listen to some music. So uh, for the four composers from uh, this year, uh, we're going to go through them in the order that they're going to be in the concert. And what we'll do is uh, they've selected an excerpt out of their piece that's going to be played by the ensemble, and then they'll tell us what they were trying to do in terms of their orchestrational aims and what they were trying to get at with this. And then we'll listen to it again so you can hear it through their mind, if you will. <laughs> so let's start off with uh, Jiang. Uh, so. <coughs> section from the previous section and um, I mean like I, I'm not sure if you were able to hear that but uh, the color of um, the, uh, like the paradigm changes and um, so uh, the wawa mute of the trombone was um, realistically um, how should I say this like, uh, like, could you please explain that um, he wasn't able to move his left hand while doing wah wah and then move to that uh, for the next sec section on the register that I originally wanted, which is like E. And then, um, e, e flat. yeah, E flat, sorry. <laughs> I, just, I needed to use the trigger mm -hmm. to reach that note, and uh, I was tied up with the wah wah. So I didn't have enough hands. <laughs> Yeah, so, well, um, <laughs> yes, so um, that was our issue, and since it was realistically impossible, I changed it an octave higher, but then uh, I bumped into another um, problem that I wanted the density to be, um, like, more rich, so um, that's why I added a pizzicato from the uh, cello as well, and also the register of the whole um, ensemble kind of moved into that um, paradigm so it can like uh, kind of be demonstrated as if it's spreading from one register. So that was like one of the um, most realistic orchestrational issues that I, we kind of um, solved all together. So yeah. Now it seems to me like in the opening that you've got a kind of a, a gesture that's happening yes. with all the instruments are being integrated. So you had to find a way to make everything sort of fit together. I mean, you see this in Pedram's piece as well. There's these sort of gestures going across instruments mm -hmm. and things like that. Mm -hmm. So um, the thing I was intending was that, like, I mean, uh, the title of my piece is The Fingers of a Shaman. So 
as if they change um, their characters when they get possessed to like a new spirit. Uh, so that's why the timbral um, combination is going to change like throughout the piece, and that's how I intended it to be like like some kind of like a huge two T um, that's like gestural, and then it goes to something like something like systemic. So yeah. Great. Now we're gonna listen to it again. piano for the next one. <laughs> um, so actually, maybe while they're preparing the piano, Darren, you can talk about That's it right. and we'll listen to it a couple of times. Uh, sure, yeah. Um, so uh, my piece um, is based on um, a prayer in Cantonese, and a lot of what I do, especially at the beginning, is about orchestrating the language. Um, so in case you don't know, um, Cantonese is a tonal language where there are specific rules about the contours um, of uh, between the words, and there's also uh, a interval um, structure between the different tones in the language. Um, and so the entire beginning of the piece is um, about the arri arrival to the, the full statement of the prayer. Um, and the, to represent the idea of praying, um, so the entire beginning is very sustained. There's a lot of resonance. And um, the important um, the t uh, microtonal inflections that are very um, uh, crucial to, to the language, to people understanding the, the, the language of Cantonese, is being teased along the way as the music uh, progresses. And so you hear a lot of um, uh, microtonal or glissandos that are uh, idiomatic or uh, that's, um, that, that is very um, um, representative of the, of the language and that's basically the opening, yeah.
first, I have a question for you. I'm interested, uh, <coughs> particularly in this one, there, there seems to be a lot of timbral modulations. You have instruments overlapping, either on the same pitches or different pitches, so you're creating kinds of very smooth timbral trajectories, and I'm wondering how that's feeding into the effect that you're trying to get for the prayer aspect of this. So, sorry, the, the question? The, 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 what's, the, if, what's the role of all this sort of timbral modulation in the effect you're trying to get in general? Um, well, first of all, it's a, um, a good blend, but it's not static. Uh, that is a very, um, by, like you said, with all the different instruments emphasizing the same frequency, especially the beginning, uh, there's this flowing, sustained, but not static way of um, like sound, and that's really effective and beautiful, I think, yeah. Okay. So my main uh, sort of abstract consideration at the beginning was to explore how I could use timber not only as a surface future, but as a structural parameter. So it's often considered, especially in music before uh, 1950, for example, that you, composers start with pitches and rhythm, and then you sort of add orchestration at the end to generate some color and things like this in a very general way, right? So my process was to, instead of doing that, and it's also things I've been doing before, is to start with timber and see how it not only could it generate interesting sounds, but it could be used uh, structurally for the composition, right? So the main sort of compositional device I was using for this particular section is the idea of imitation, but based on, uh, on timber instead of either a motivic treatment or pitch contour or things like this. So you have small uh, cells uh, which I've 
temporal properties that are sort of distributed across the instrument. And then I'm trying to achieve sort of phrase-like structures uh, blending these things, uh, these little cells in a sequential way. Seems to me like you're also playing with uh, differences between continuities and discontinuities of timbre as a kind of sculpting. You know. Yes, there are actually, in this very short excerpt, there are many, there are more or less three or four uh, phrases, right? So I needed a, a way to, for the, the audience to perceive that uh, a phrase is sort of finished or has begun and so on. So I tried to figure out ways beyond just you know, putting a rest between these, these phrases so that it could be perceived in all sorts of uh, registral discontinuities and uh, more sudden changes between uh, temporal properties occur. So it's, it's, for example, it's inside a single phrase, everything is sort of continuous in terms of, uh, of temporal perception. But then at some point, uh, even if you don't have a silence between these two phrases, the, the discontinuity makes it perceivable that it's a new sentence. Well, a big part of mine, if you look at the, were to look at the music, um, there's a lot of crescendos and decrescendos. So I kind of, I was thinking a little spatially, in a, like in a timbral way, the kind of like, um, like the ocean would have, you know, if there was stuff coming up from the ocean, something would come uh, visible and then it would disintegrate away and then something else would come visible as it rises to the top, like almost like bubbles rising. Um, so that little clip had, um, there's chords and, um, that are played by the, the vibraphone and the piano, but they're getting colored by the other instruments. And they're kind of these, they're chords, but they're, I call them like modal palettes and they're kind of what I paint with. And there's, there's, I want harmony to be there and I want a little melody, but I don't want to develop that. I was developing the timbre. Um, so part of it was like to get, if I was coloring with these modal palettes, how was I going to get it to not sound, um, yeah, like a straight up, uh, I don't know how I, I'm not explaining this very well, but anyways, I'm doing my best. Um, so I had a repeated, repeated notes happening um, where uh, instruments are kind of highlighting the main chords that are going on. Um, and I had those repeated, those seems to, seem to work really well. Um, and then just having um, uh, multiple voices coming in and out at different times really, really worked really well. And um, also there's a kind of a phasing effect where I have two instruments that are 
sound like they should be in sync, but they're not in sync. And this creates this other really interesting timbral um, kind of effect um, as it goes through that progression. So, so there's like a melody fragment there, but it doesn't really get developed. It's more manipulated timbrally. So. Yeah, I really like that timbral heter heterophony that you put in there at times like that. One thing that strikes me about this in particular is the um, where you place different instruments register-wise, and it creates a kind of, uh, you pick certain instruments in certain registers, and this changes over the whole, the whole piece, but it creates a timbral atmosphere that slowly evolves as you move through the piece as well. Yeah, it's definitely about, like, the, I love the idea of slow transition, which I think to really perceive a lot of the timbral stuff, it, it, those processes need to be slowed down a little bit, so. Um, but then I just also think it's a big, bigger palette, like, you know, pitch uh, or range creates kind of this dimension that I think there's a lot to play with, so. I'd like to basically open it up to the audience if anybody has any questions um, for any person on the panel or just general questions you want to throw out there and we'll find somebody to actually answer them. <laughs> Lindsay. Uh, just repeat the question for people that are online. Uh, for the composers, was there any particular combination of instruments or techniques that they particularly thought were really cool and when they were actually putting these things together? Yeah, can I? Get yeah, you first, yeah. for sure. Yeah, yeah I, I discovered this, uh, this peculiar technique of working with uh, trombonist Micah, uh, which is to reverse the, act, the embouchure, the, sorry, the mouthpiece of the trombone, and to combine it with the, I mean, Sorry, what's the name? Uh, what's the name of your, your percussion instrument? The vibra slap, right? And it sort of creates a <laughs> iterative sound, right? And this is one way that I use the timbral limitation. Give us a go, Yes, the like, yeah, measure uh, 17. <laughs> 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 Yeah, I mean, to be very clear, like, percussion that measures 16 plays the greer gesture. Yeah. And then it sort of gets imitated by the trombone. Right? Yeah. And if you combine it with the percussion. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> harmonics mixed with the bowed vibraphone um, and then in the process having them kind of cross each other so as one was crescendoing one was decrescendoing so they kind of cross in this really interesting way yeah so in time both the sounds together and then the sounds together in time in a process in a dynamic envelope it's definitely really cool as well Anybody else want to jump in there? Um, yeah, sure. Uh, well, um, <laughs> uh, there's four instruments involved. Um, it's actually one of uh, one of my um, the phrases that I've written. Uh, it's the phrase where the flute plays whistle tone, 
and the violin plays like an artificial harmonic glissando, and the piano um, plays the like inside the strings on the highest register with um, the fingers and but like slurred. Uh, and then what was the last one? Yeah, um, like arco on the vibraphone. So like when they're all combined, it sounds really like fragile, like as if it's like cloudy crystals. <laughs> So yeah, um, but like you're gonna listen to it uh, like at the real concert, so <laughs> stay tuned. Anybody <laughs> else? Darren. Yeah, um, uh, I really like um, the when there's uh, the, the whole ensemble is playing all together a single chord, and the bass frequencies or the bass lower notes are all fading out as the higher notes are all. Um, getting louder, this cross fading, and it's like uh, the high register is overpowering at the end of the process. It's like um, lifting, it's, like, it's very uplifting, and this effect is very effective. And it was towards the end of the, the, the short excerpt that we were playing there, and I really like that. Right. Thanks. Any other questions from the audience? Or what? The use of the voice for in the instrument, in the woodwind instruments, mm. really. Yeah, well, you'll see tonight, it's uh, just hidden inside. It creates this weird, also like a uh, semantic aspect that is very unusual and really breaks through in the texture. It's really... Yeah. Uh, and for my piece, uh, you'll hear tonight, uh, the use of single string multiphonics in the violin, uh, which are essentially these very sort of impure or dirty harmonics uh, just, an, in my opinion, a very underutilized, uh, under-researched uh, technique. So. Anybody else have any questions? Counting. Yes, so for, first thing, thank you everybody for this wonderful workshop. Um, uh, mostly right on, on the comments, so Guillaume, about uh, the morning view of uh, uh, the role taken by the composer and the performer and the hierarchy, hierarchy that, uh, that's completely uh, uh, questioned in, in this kind of project. Um, uh, and you can, you, can, you can see that uh, this kind of process uh, produces very rich uh, results and we can hope that it's going to be uh, more and more frequent, frequent uh, to have that uh, such a depth in the collaboration between composers and performers. And so the, the question I, I, uh, um, I would ask is, uh, so how, how uh, are you comp the composers here? Um, do you consider, have you thought of a way to acknowledge uh, the contribution of the performers to the pieces? For example, in the notes, uh, 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 the introduction of the score? Um, and is that something you know that we could uh, make a, a promotion of? You know, uh, because this, this collaboration between composers and performers is in fact quite frequent. Not not in that at that level of of, uh, of depth, but um, the, the performers who, who have uh, contributed to the to the birth of the piece have a significant uh, contribution. So how how did, how how could we um, acknowledge that? So for people online, Cowding's uh, talking about the sort of horizontalization of the relation between composers and performers and asking, the, uh, given that it's very, very collaborative, this whole process, uh, in what way can the composers actually recognize in the score itself the contribution of the performers? So we'll open that one up. You guys did it, right? Yep. <laughs> for Core One. So. Yes. I, I mean, I think first and foremost, putting a uh, very direct acknowledgement in the prefatory notes to the score uh, is at a minimum, uh, you know, and then promotion of and direct attribution whenever discussing uh, a piece because the, the piece itself was partially created by the performers uh, who are, uh, who, you know, collaborated, uh, one of whom is here tonight, uh, the others hopefully are maybe watching or uh, We'll get the recording, but yeah, absolutely, it's I think essential uh, because it's not just the work of the composer, but 
Yeah, I think mentioning them in the in a note in the beginning of the score, and uh, but I think it's quite a tradition to to mention actually the, the people who premiere the piece, for uh, for composers to mention them in the score in the beginning, maybe not under the the certification like from a creative input, so it's maybe just a few words to add. But uh, yeah. And so the current composers, what's your idea about uh, including recognition? Of yeah, I think it's really important. Like I even, I did a collaborative project with the bass player and we worked really closely together. So I even put in the score, like this would not have been possible, like without um, the help from the, or from the performer. But I also think that it's, again, maybe all of us can contribute to that, the audience knowing the process that goes on. I think that goes back to what I was saying before where it's like, instead of being like, here's the finished product, being like, look, this is how we created it. And it in itself was a magical experience. Like, it's not just about reading the book and getting to the end. You know, you always get to the end of the book and you're like, oh man, the book's done, you know? So the, the pro honoring the process of, oh, when you're actually working on, on the thing and, and getting people to know about that process. I think also would go far in um, acknowledging the role the performers have, but also, um, the role of art and how much of a process it is. I think people would, um, it would be good for them to respect the arts process a little bit more. I think they would have more respect if they knew how much work we put into it, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Could I yeah. mention something? Um, I've worked with, I've been lucky enough to work with composers um, before and I always find it rather flattering when it's just at the top of the score uh, written for these people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe even something like that or uh, written for and in collaboration with these <laughs> artists, something like that. I don't know, for me as a performer, that's just like, wow, my name's on the school. Yeah. <laughs> so nice. The dedication, right? Yeah, exactly. At the very top of the score. Exactly, right? <laughs> yeah. I find that, that really lovely. And you, you see that in, in pieces um, that were written, you know, in the 1800s. It was like written for this flute player, you know, yeah. and you're like, wow. You know, so I, I think that for us is, is very um, flattering and we feel very acknowledged by that. Right. Any last words, Gil? Mm -hmm. We have to wrap it up. Yeah, with pleasure. Uh, no, I was thinking to further this idea of um, uh, horizontal dimension. It's also true from a pedagogical point of view because uh, as you may notice, uh, may have noticed, uh, the two teachers, two supervisors of, of this, of this uh, the core at McGill, we are not composers and even less uh, composition teachers, psychologists, uh, performer, conductor. And, um, and so um, I, I don't mean that uh, uh, composition teacher, teachers are useless, of course, but uh, <laughs> in, this, in this framework, um, the, the learning process uh, was um, a lot between performers and composers. So compo composers, I think, have taught uh, performers about many things and the opposite as well. Performers have taught uh, the, the composers. And even between the teachers and the, and the students, um, I think teachers uh, learned a lot from, from what we did to get together all, the, all over this year. And uh, the students uh, taught uh, us uh, actually as well. Yeah. So that's that's more complex than uh, uh, a descendant uh, perspective in terms of teaching and uh, and uh, creating. Great. Well, I think we need to wrap it up there because we got to get the hall ready for the concert. I want to thank all the performers and conductor and all the composers for participating in this panel. Thank you very much. Thank you.